Church, it's so good to see you today. We're so glad that you're here with us on this rainy Sunday morning. As we do every single week, we want to give you an opportunity where we pray and believe for God to do miracles and heal bodies. So I want to invite our prayer team and our hosts to make their way to the front. And church, I just want to remind you, we read it every single week, but it's so powerful. What James 5 says, it says, if anyone among you is sick, they should call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Come on, today if you need healing in your body or you know someone who does, we have faith to believe that Jesus is here, the healer is here. So God, we trust you, we look to you as our healer. God, I ask you to come and do miracles this morning. God, increase our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If that's you, if you need healing or you want to stand in for someone who does, you can make your way to the front now. We're believing in the miracle working God today. Come on, let's give him praise. Feel your spirit stirring. 
to sing miracle. Miracles after miracle. Open door after open door. Here it comes. So get ready for another one. Because another one is on the way. Miracle after miracle. Open door after open door. Here it comes. So get ready for another one. Because another one is on the way. You know, church, today I know that some of us can sing that song knowing the miracle work of God, the power of God. But I know that some of us today are singing in faith because we haven't seen our miracle yet. And can I tell you that faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus is saying, I've seen it and I know it. And I say that he's good, but also even when I haven't seen it, I say, God, you're good, you're faithful, and I put my hope in you. So today, no matter where you're at, whether you're walking in your miracle or you're waiting on your miracle, can we stand and say, God, in every season, you are good. Come on, would you lift your hands all over this room and just say, God, in every season, you are good. We trust you today, Jesus. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Come on, lift your voices and say, I love your voice, Lord I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Yeah. 
been so, so kind with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Church, can you give God some praise this morning? Jesus, we love you, and we thank you so much for your goodness that never gives up on us, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. Oaks Church, you can grab a seat, and I just want to say good morning to you. Thank you for braving the storm. Right. It was wild, but yes. man, if I haven't met you before, I'm Andrew. This is Kate. We get to serve as the youth and kids pastors here at Oaks Church. And if you are with us online, just want to let you know it's going to be a great morning. Get the comments going. We're glad you're here. Yeah, so glad you're here. And if it's your first time to be with us today, I want to encourage you to take this orange connect card and fill it out. You can drop it in a bucket as they pass in a few minutes. Or better yet, you can take this and walk it outside. We've got a beautiful connect center with amazing people and a gift for you there. I want to encourage you to do that. Um, but you may have been here for a while and have been wondering how to get involved. How do you find your people, your place, your purpose here at Oaks Church? Well, that's easy. Your next step is is to go to Growth Track. It happens every first and third Sunday around here during the 1030 service, and we'd love to see you there. Well, Oaks Church, if you believe we serve a God of miracles, can you say amen? Amen. Every yes. single week we're praying. You just saw us praying up here. We got the prayer meeting on Wednesday, but if you have a need, financial, physical, anything, we want to believe for a miracle for you and your family. All you got to do is fill out one of these prayer cards, drop it in the offering bucket in just a minute, and we're going to be praying with you. But I got a praise report right here. I love this story. Check this out. It's from a mom who said, six months ago, I came to an Oaks Women Night. Oaks Women, where are you at? In the place. Oaks Women Night. And I prayed that God would restore communication between me and my kids. Not only did God answer my prayer, but last Sunday, five of my kids got baptized. Amazing. Come on. Amazing. That is amazing. God is answering prayers, and we want to believe for a miracle for you. So write it down. Yes, we do. Okay, guys, I have some exciting news because today registration opens for Oaks Kids Summer Bash. Yes, we are so pumped. Summer Bash is a three-day day camp that is loaded with fun. And parents, I want to just tell you, Summer Bash is everything you want for your kids this summer. It's chocked full of team competitive games and the best services that your kids will have ever gone to. We are going to be talking about freedom and believing that God will give freedom to your kids. Freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, from shame, from all the things that our kids are dealing with these days and we're just praying that your kids will experience that same freedom and then of course later in the summer july 31st to august 4th we have oaks youth yes. summer camp it's back we can't wait and at oaks youth we believe life change happens at camp guys our teens are experiencing so many pressures so many things from social media and just from school in life but we believe that gen z is going to be suicide free yes. can i get an amen? amen we believe that gen z is going to see jesus as the solution to the mental health crisis experience freedom purpose and calling so if you have a teenager if you know a teenager you got a niece yes. nephew son daughter anybody let's get them registered and you can scan the qr on the screen or on that next gen card that you That's got right. when you walked in you can sign up for oaks kids summer bash or 
Oaks Youth Camp. We're going to continue worshiping today through giving. And as our auditorium hosts come forward, I just want to highlight another Next Gen ministry that we have around here called Oaks College. Yes, and actually... Which I have to say, like, I'm an Oaks College graduate. Yes, and I am too. Half of our staff is an Oaks College <laughs> That's graduate. right. Yes, Oaks College exists to develop and train students who want to go into vocational ministry. And I just have to say, I'm the pastor that I am today because of the foundation that I got in Oaks College. Um, and this last Thursday was really special. We got to celebrate 13 um, students who completed the Oaks College program at their commissioning service. So we want to celebrate them today. Um, but also, I just want to let you guys know the part you've played in that. Kingdom Builders, thank you so much for your generosity. Because of your giving, we're able to scholarship students who wouldn't otherwise be able to come and um, be a part of a training program like this. So thank you so much for your faithful giving. Okay, guys, let's prepare to give with joy in our hearts. We got three ways to give on screen. And if you could just bow your heads and close your eyes, we're going to pray a blessing over this offering. God, we love you. And we pray in Jesus' name that you would bless every kingdom builder as they give every dollar that's given to expand your kingdom here locally and around the world. And I pray you continue to speak to your people this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said. Amen. Hey guys, as you walked in, you got a little card that says Next Gen Sunday. And our goal today is for you to know how much Oaks Kids loves your family and how we are for your family. And we just wanted to um, take a minute to just showcase everything that's happening here at Oaks Church from birth all the way through young adults. So you guys check out this video. At Oaks Church, the future is our focus. We have seen the statistics surrounding the next generation, and we refuse to stand idly by. A 2024 study found that only 60% of 8 to 12 year olds have ever opened a Bible. 70% of young adults walk away from their faith after high school. Currently, 55% of teens say that they struggle with anxiety on a regular basis. But at Oaks Church, we're here to partner with parents so that our kids, students, and young adults can experience the life change that only Jesus brings. We believe that the next generation will break the status quo. From birth, we're ready to resource you to have a godly home. We've got child dedication where we want to celebrate and equip you on your parenting journey as you commit to raising your child in the faith. We also have Oaks Learning Center here to care for your little ones daily and create a foundation of faith and education from the youngest age through preschool. We believe that in Oaks Kids, children can encounter God in a real way. And we want to reinforce the godly lifestyle that you are building in your family. In preschool, kids will learn that church is fun through worship, games, and activities. As kids enter elementary, they'll experience the presence of God while learning to pray and love God's word. And whenever your child makes a decision to follow Jesus, we'll be there ready to cheer them on at our salvation parties, helping kids understand the most important decision that they will ever make. Summer Bash is another opportunity for your child to have fun in church while engaging in powerful, upbeat services and making memories with friends. This three-day experience will set the spiritual trajectory of your child's faith each year. And at Oaks Youth, we exist to help students know Jesus and make Him known. Starting in sixth grade, we're here to partner with you. We start off with a sixth grade party where your student can connect to other kids their age and you can learn more about your student's new journey in Oaks U. Each and every Wednesday night, sixth to 12th graders are taught biblical truths that apply to their present and future lives. We want students to encounter Jesus here through worship and times of prayer. And we also have a desire to help students cultivate faith-filled friendships, which is why we have junior high and high school small groups every spring and fall semester. And Oaks Youth, we believe small groups are a big deal because life is better together. And in fact, it's impossible to do alone. We're also big believers that your student can impact others for Jesus. Oaks Youth Student Leadership is our gathering for student leaders, a time of leadership development for those who want to serve in the church or start a Jesus club. And we can't forget camp. We believe life change happens at camp and we see it every single year. Students get away from the day-to-day -day life to dig deep into God's presence and have some fun in team competition with their friends. It's a great time of incredible impact on students' lives. After high school, we want to resource young adults to discover their identity as men and women of God. 
Every week, we're meeting up with young adults to help them navigate the twists and turns of their newly embraced adulthood and point them back to God's word as their foundation. We also believe that growth happens in the context of community. So in addition to our services, our small groups provide connection during pivotal seasons of a young adult's life, such as singleness, dating, becoming a newlywed, and building a young family. So whatever part of the parenting journey you're on, whether it's a tough season or a great season, remember that God has a plan and a purpose for your children. He's a good father to them, and he's a good father to you as you parent and lead the next generation. Pretty awesome, right? I'm so um, proud of our next gen team and how hard they work to serve the families of this church, your family, and to resource with tools and all kinds of resources to help create healthy families from the kids' resource wall over in the kids' area. They've got every age and stage represented there, tons of tools and resources for you there. And our online stuff is being updated all the time. You can go check that out and get resources for your family. I just really encourage you, if you want more information, you want to sign those kids up for camp, uh, either Kids Bash or Youth Camp, go out to the lobby. Our team's out there. There's a booth for every one of our ministries out there uh, for families. And uh, just check it out. Ask your questions. Um, get your kids signed up for camp, and we'd love to serve you. Listen, Oaks Church is for your family. So much of what we do here is to help strengthen and create healthy families. In fact, let me remind you about the series that we're in on Wednesday nights at our prayer meeting. We're in a series called Fight for Your Family. If you've not come to the prayer meeting yet, man, I'd really encourage you to come check it out this Wednesday night. Uh, so far, we've talked about how to fight for your family, how to fight for your kids. This Wednesday night, we're going to talk about how to fight for your marriage. And so if that's something that you need maybe to hear more about, to, to pray through, uh, I would encourage you to be here this Wednesday night. I'm going to bring a teaching um, on marriage, and we're going to just spend some time at the altar praying and seeking God for the marriages of our church, the marriages of our community and just really, really excited about what God is doing in our families. We got to fight for our families because the enemy is attacking our families like never before. And so the church has to wake up to that and do our best to fight for our families. We're fighting for yours. And uh, so just blessed to be a part of a church that's always valued that. Well, today we're continuing our series in the book of Exodus. You guys ready to get in the Word of God today? Get your Bibles out. Notes are going to be on the screen, and uh, we've been in this series for several weeks, going chapter by chapter. This Old Testament book of Exodus, we feel, you know, part of how we strengthen families. One of the greatest gifts that we can give you is a foundation in the Word of God. And again, can you just get a vision with me? Can you just imagine that all of those little kids that we dedicate at child dedication, those little babies and toddlers, that if they grow up in a church over 18 years, that prioritizes God's word, that is just systematically teaching the word of God, they're going to leave this church, they're going to leave your house ready to face the pressures and the challenges of the world because they'll have a firm foundation in God's word. So that's why we do what we do. And so we're uh, preaching through books of the Bible. We've been through Genesis, spent a long time there. Uh, and then we did some New Testament books. Now we're in Exodus. And uh, we're going to cover several chapters today. Because we're looking at the plagues. And instead of taking you uh, through 10 weeks of plagues, we're going to combine some of these. We're going to look at the first nine today and then number 10 next uh, Sunday. Um, but the story of Exodus, as we've been talking about, is the story of how God delivered his people from bondage. They had been 400 years in bondage and being tormented by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It's a story of how God rescues them, how they exit out of Egypt. And so we see um, also that this is a foreshadowing, especially these next several chapters, of what Jesus came to do. In fact, a lot of people call Exodus kind of like the gospel of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of similarities between what we see God do for his people uh, here in Egypt to what Jesus came to do for all of us. For both, the message to the enemy is very clear. Let my people go. <laughs> there's only one God and you ain't him, and there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, come on somebody, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all the enemies of God will one day be judged. That's kind of what we're talking about today, actually. We're going to see the judgment of God on Pharaoh in Egypt through these 
ten plagues, these ten acts of judgment. As we go through them, you're going to see a few themes. These themes are present throughout the book of Exodus, but they're going to really come to the surface here uh, today and then again next week. And I want to give you those four themes. Write these down. We're going to see these play out over and over again. The first theme that we're going to see is very clear today. Judgment for sin. Talk more about that in a second. Then you're also going to see the opportunity to repent. A lot of people get stuck on why would God do all of this death and destruction, right? If he's a loving God, why would he do this? Well, God will judge sin, but he gives opportunities to repent. He brings warnings to the enemy. Hey, if you don't repent and call on the name of the Lord, there's going to be judgment on your sin. And I want you just to see as we go through these plagues today, God is continually warning Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He's continuing to give even the enemies of his people opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. And then we see God's deliverance. Praise God for that. He rescues and delivers his people. And we see that. And then next week we'll talk more about this, but we also see it with Jesus. Bloodshed for salvation. And so these are the themes that we're going to see over the next couple of weeks. Judgment for sin, opportunity to repent, God's deliverance, and bloodshed for salvation. Today we're going to see a lot of judgment. Judgment's hard to talk about, isn't it? I tell you, it's hard to preach about. Uh, I'd much uh, prefer to preach about the grace and the mercy of God than the judgment of God. But both are part of the character of God. In fact, there is no love without justice. We wouldn't know his grace if there wasn't his judgment. And so we've got to talk about these things that we see in Scripture that sometimes are hard to talk about. And maybe you've read through some of the Old Testament and you see some of these things that God does, and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that God would do that or that God would allow that. And it's just kind of, why, why? Why would he do that? He's a loving God. Why would he bring so much death and destruction? But here's what we need to remember. The holiness of God demands justice. Again, without no justice, there is no love. Without his judgment, we wouldn't know his grace. And for those who reject God's judgment, by the way, sin will be judged. Sin will be judged. We see that throughout Scripture. Jesus came with a message to repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. And so many of his parables talked about the judgment that would come if you didn't call on the name of the Lord. And so we see judgment throughout Scripture. For those who reject God, judgment for them is a source of offense and fear. Offense in that, how could God do that to people? Fear in that, would God really do that to me? But for those who put their hope in the Lord, judgment is a source of hope, right? I mean, if you're an Egyptian sympathizer, then this seems offensive. This seems harsh. But if you're an Israelite, you're sick of living in a time of injustice and oppression and slavery and torment, and the judgment that God brings to his enemy is a source of hope to you. So as you consider the judgment of God, is it for you a source of fear or a source of hope? That reveals a lot about kind of your heart for God and how you view God. Here's the good news. By the way, we've all got a little bit of Pharaoh in us. We've all got a little bit of Egypt in us. The fact of the matter is we're all an oppressor. We've all rejected God. We see in God's word that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us in this room should be judged for what we've done, our rebellion and our sin, right? None of us are perfect. None of us have clean thoughts 100% of the time. None of us have a spotless record. Some of us don't even have a spotless record so far today, <laughs> right? It's true. It's like an hour-by-hour hour battle. We all deserve the judgment of God. But here's the good news. For those who put their faith in God, mercy triumphs over judgment. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you repented of your sin, you deserve judgment. You're just not going to get ultimate judgment because mer the mercy of God, the grace of God triumphs 
over your judgment. So we're going to go through these plagues, and I'm going to hit on each one of them. And so I would encourage you, it's a very much a teaching day today, less than a preaching day. Um, and so I just want to highlight this. You're going to see the increasing intensity of these plagues. Isn't that what sin does? There's an increasing intensity of sin in the world and in our lives at times. So I want us to feel every one of these plagues. I want us to do our best to get in that time and in that place and imagine what that would have been like and felt like as we talk about the judgment of God. Now, at the end of chapter 6, where we left off last week, Moses, despite God giving him signs and saying over and over again, I'm Yahweh, I, I, I am who I am, I am with you, I'm going to equip you and empower you to do what I've called you to do, Moses is once again here at the end of chapter 6 not feeling it. He's like, God, the people won't listen to me. Why should they? I'm weak. I, I, I don't speak well. You've got the wrong guy. I've been telling you over and over again, Lord, pick someone else. I'm not your dude. Uh, and here again, instead of God just totally squashing Moses uh, for all of his uh, inadequacies and constant excuses, God gives him a message of encouragement and empowerment once again that's going to lead to Moses obeying the Lord finally. And so here's what it says, uh, Exodus chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. What does that mean? I have given you authority over Pharaoh. The most powerful person on the face of the earth, the one you're so afraid of, I'm telling you, you have authority over him. What does the New Testament say? He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. The followers of Jesus, we carry with us the Spirit of God. We have authority. It's a foreshadowing right here. I've made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron will be your prophet. He will speak on your behalf. You are to say everything I command you. And your brother Aaron is to tell, uh, tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Remember, that's the message. Let my people go. I'm going to deliver them. Aaron is to tell Pharaoh, let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. What does it mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Does he not even give Pharaoh a chance? Is he the one making it where Pharaoh won't understand or, or won't listen or won't change? No, I know it seems like that when we read it in this language, but what that means is that when we're exposed, this is all people, when we're exposed to the glory of God, you think about maybe someone that's not a believer, they come into a church service like this, they hear the songs that are sung, they hear the message that's given, there's an evidence of the Lord in the place. Every time we're exposed to the glory of God, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to soften our heart toward God, or it's going to harden our heart to resist God. This is not God doing it. This is God knowing how Pharaoh is going to respond to it. God's about to reveal his glory. And instead of softening his heart, Pharaoh is going to harden his heart towards the things of God. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And there is kind of a key indicator of why God is doing this. To make sure Moses knows. To make sure the Israelites know. To make sure Pharaoh knows. All of Egypt and all of the world will see these acts of God's power and know that he is the Lord. And they'll know this when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Finally, right? They finally do it. Moses was 80 years old, and his buddy Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. So if you got a little gray on your head, if you're in your 70s, 80s, or 90s, guess what? God ain't done with you yet. There's still time. God wants to use you to reveal his glory to this world. These were old dudes, old heads, and God still used them to do incredible things. So what's about to play out over these next 10 plagues, nine of them we're going to look at today, is really a battle between good and evil. It's a battle between the powers of heaven, the powers of this world. It's a battle between God and Satan. And it's a battle that plays out every day now in our world, and it's a battle that plays out, honestly, in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. And what we need to know is that the enemies of God will be judged. 
that those who put their faith in him will reign victorious and that there is no God like Jehovah. That's the message throughout. And in fact, I'm going to need your help as we go through these plagues because every one of these plagues is to give the same message. And so when we get to the end of it, I'm going to prompt you. I'm going to say there is no God like, and then you're going to say Jehovah, okay? Can we practice that real quick? Here we go. There is no God like? Oh, you're feeling good today. All right. That's what we're going to do. So let's start first with the, the first plague, the plague of blood. Chapter, ew, I know. Chapter 7, verse 17. By this you will know that I am the Lord. God tells Moses and Pharaoh to go warn, uh, Moses and Aaron to go warn the Pharaoh that this plague is about to happen. And so they go warn him. And they say, by this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. Verse 21, that's exactly what happened. The fish in the Nile died. The river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. This first plague is a direct shot at the identity of Egypt, the economy of Egypt, the religious system of Egypt. The Nile was their life. It was their identity. That, that river that ran through Egypt was everything to them. They worshiped the Nile. They had a god named Hopi that they worshiped. It was the god of the Nile. And so what God does is he comes and he strikes their religious system, he strikes their economy, he strikes at their very identity. And he's like, you worship this river god named Hopi. Well, let me show you what I can do. I can reduce your god to nothing. I can turn what is your identity and your pride, your national pride, and I can use it as an act of judgment against you. Just like that, I can turn this water into blood to a place that you cannot even go to it. It smells so bad, you can't drink from it. Your economy will suffer because of it. Why? Because he's letting them know there is no God like Jehovah. No God like Jehovah. Then you see the second plague, the plague of frogs. Ooh, I don't like frogs. Verse, uh, verse 3. Again, there's a warning to the Pharaoh, but he doesn't listen to the warning. Verse 3, the Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace, into your bedroom, and onto your bed. And can you imagine after a long day of work, a nice bath, some candles, not me, but Kara. I don't do that. Some nice music, watch a sitcom, go to bed, all of a sudden, ribbit, ribbit. Not just one, not just two, but dozens of frogs are coming up your legs and into your pajamas. And I mean, it is nasty. These frogs, daggum frogs, are everywhere. They'll come onto your officials and your people and into your ovens and your kneading troughs. They're gonna be on that big island you have in your kitchen and in your cabinets and in your Tupperware and they're just gonna be everywhere, these frogs. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and the can uh, canals and ponds and make frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. And that's what they did. Frogs were everywhere, it's disgusting. I mean. I can't handle one little frog that gets in my garage and he disappears. I don't know where he is. I guess he's there forever. I don't know. Months go by. I'm still thinking about that guy. Where is he? How's he doing? You know, is he behind the fridge? Is he, is he uh, you know, in my golf bag? You know, I don't know where he is. Uh, but those little rascals, and today, today, I mean, they're going to be all over the place today, right? And so those frogs, can you imagine, though, that just, they're just everywhere you can't get rid of them? And this was another attack at the identity and the uh, religion of Egypt. Egypt worshiped this God called Hecate, 
It was their fertility god. And they would build idols that had the head of a frog. So all over Egypt would have been this idol that represented health and fertility of their people. And it had the head of a frog. How good is God? How funny is God that he judges them with the very thing that they worship? And the thing that they worship has now become an offense to them, has now become a, 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 a torture and a torment to them. They, they are everything. You want frogs? It's like maybe your parent caught you uh, smoking when you were a teenager. And you want to smoke? Oh, I'll show you. And they put a carton of cigarettes in your mouth. Smoke them all at once. And the idea would be that you had so many you would never do it again. Right? That even work on anybody? I don't know. Kind of the same deal. Oh, you want to worship a frog? I'll show you frogs. And the whole land, they're just frogs everywhere. It's the fertility God. Now, remember what Pharaoh did back in chapter 1, talking about fertility? What did he do back in chapter 1? He was so concerned about the Israelites growing and becoming numerous. He was so concerned by the promise of God on these people and how they were being blessed and how they were growing, even though they were tormenting these people, that he attacked their fertility. He tried to kill every newborn baby boy. That was back in chapter 1. Here's what God does. You want to attack my people? You want to try to rob them of their promise? You want to attack their fertility and their, their reproductive ability? I'm going to come and show you. I'm going to reduce your God. And God goes into Egypt, and he takes back what belongs to his people. He goes into the enemy's camp. And he took back what he stole, the promise of God, the fertility that was on them. And he said, let me show you, Egypt, what I'm about to do. I'm about to go in and restore everything, Pharaoh, you've tried to take. It's what he's going to do in your life. God is going to go in to the enemy's camp and restore everything that's been taken from you. And the promise of God will continue to rest on your life. It's like that old song. He went to the enemy's camp and he took back what he stole from me. How many of you know that? Took back what he stole from me. It's old time. Took back what he stole. Oh, he went to the enemy's camp, and he took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Come on, somebody. That's what he does. That's what he does. I may not be peace skizzle, but I got, I, I, there's a little something there. Just a little bit. Let's come up with a name for a nerdy, not peace gizzle. I don't know. Egypt worshipped so many gods. They had over 80 gods they worshipped. They worshipped anything that moved. They were a polytheistic, synchristic religion, which means they just combined everything they saw that they liked into one religion that made sense. They liked, they liked, they just wor they worshipped everything. They were known to worship the, uh, the, the ram, the wolf, the lion, the hippo, the crocodile. Uh, they they worshipped frogs. They worshipped uh, insects like the locust. They worshipped dogs. They worshipped cats. That's how you know they were messed up people. They worshipped cats. Ain't nothing. It's terrible. They worshipped cats. They worshipped anything. They worshipped a, they worshipped a man. They made this guy Pharaoh a god that they worshipped. They worshipped everything. And you look at that like, how could they do that? But you have to ask, is that very different from the culture that we live in today? We have a lot of gods, a lot of things that we worship. I know we might not think it. It might not be trees and frogs and bugs that we worship, but sometimes we worship our kids, and sometimes we worship our work, and sometimes we worship our stuff, and sometimes we worship a relationship, and sometimes we worship all the things that bring us comfort and pleasure. Come on, in Texas, we're known. We, we worship our sports teams. Anybody guilty of that? Yeah, I mean, like sometimes that's, a, that's an issue for me. Uh, I don't know if you guys were following the NFL draft, but you know you got problems when it's Saturday at 3 and you're checking who your team drafted in round 7 and you're doing a deep dive on that offensive lineman that they took in round 7. But maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm worshiping sports a little too much. We can worship a lot of things. You're like, I don't worship those. Well, show me how you spend your time and your money, and I'll be able to show you what you worship. The fact of the matter is a lot of us worship things that we put above God. And anything that we worship and put above God is an idol of worship. And what we're seeing here 
is that I, our idolatry and sin will be judged. But for those who put their faith in God, there will be victory. There will be grace. There will be deliverance. There will be salvation because there's no God like no God like Jehovah. The plague of gnats. Oof. Plague of gnats, verse 17. Aaron stretched out. This, by the way, there's no warning on this one. And that's a pattern that we see. With the first two plagues, there's a warning to Pharaoh. Then the third, there's no warning. Then the next two, there's going to be a warning to Pharaoh. Then the one after that, no warning. And then the next two, a warning to Pharaoh. Then the one after that, no warning. There's a pattern, and it's for a purpose. But this one, there's no warning. Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground. Gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. You ever been at your kid's game? Pull out that peanut butter and jelly sandwich and that bag of Cool Ranch Doritos, and you're just like, well, where did all these gnats come from? And they're like, they seem to be only around your head. You feel like Pigpen from Charlie Brown. Like, why are they only around me? Can you imagine gnats everywhere? As far, I mean, you just can't get away from them. They're just in your nose or in your clothes or just in your head. I mean, they're just everywhere. It's, just, it's disgusting. What's the message here from the plague of gnats? There's no God like, no God like Jehovah. The plague of flies, chapter 8, verse 24. There's a warning to Pharaoh this time. And in verse 24, dense swarm of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses and his officials Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by flies. Not annoyance, ruined. Annoyance is you can't grill anything outside in Texas without big flies all over everything you're trying to do, right? That's annoying. But flies like this, they ruined the land. There were so many of them. But Pharaoh would not relent, and he would not repent. And so next we see the plague on livestock, chapter 9, verse 6. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. God's making a distinction between those who put their faith in him and those who don't. Were the Israelites perfect? No, not by a long shot. But they put their faith in God, and so mercy triumphs over judgment. So there's a distinction here. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died, yet his heart was unrelenting, and he would not let the people go. What's the message here once again? There is no God like. Next, the plague of boils. Now it turns on the people themselves and their skin. Verse number 10 of chapter 9. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Again, he's warned here. Moses tossed it into the air, and festering boils broke out on people and animals. Can you imagine just being a little poodle? Just going like, hey, what did I ever do to anybody? How come I've got boils all over my little paw, you know? Poor, poor guys. Verse 11, the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all of Egypt. It goes on to say the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again. He was exposed to the glory of God, but instead of softening his heart, his heart was hardened. God is still trying to teach him there is no God like the plague of hail. Verse 13, then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh. He's warned. Say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people. So you may know there is no one like me in all the earth. There is no God like. For by now, in case you haven't figured it out, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with the plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Yet you still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Verse 23, when Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground, so the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of God, of all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. You know what's interesting to me? All these plagues, all this warning, all this opportunity to repent. 
And Pharaoh refuses to give in. He doubles down. You ever notice how sometimes people you know, maybe, maybe it's been you in your life, no matter how many signs God brings to them, no, how, many, how many warnings God gives to them, no matter how much evidence is before them of the path that they're on is not a good one, it's leading to trouble, it's causing destruction. I'm amazed at how many times people will say, listen, it's my issue that hurt anybody else but me. It's under control. And they go a little further with sin. All of a sudden their marriage is falling apart. And they say, listen, that was bound to happen. It's not because of that. It's because of something else. And then they go a little further and their kids are acting out. And they go a little further and it's affecting their work. And they get to literally rock bottom. And instead of repenting or turning towards the Lord, they double down on the lies they've been telling themselves. You ever known anybody like that? It's like, come on, wake up. Don't you see what you're doing is killing you? It's ruining your family. It's going to destroy your kids and their kids after them. But they refuse to get in. It's, it's cognitive dissonance. It means that no matter what evidence is before you, you refuse to see and interpret it as the truth, and you continue on your path. You double down on the lies, and you refuse to change. That happens all the time in our world. I want to say to you, if that's you today, see today in this message as another warning from the Lord. The way you're living, it's going to ruin your life. You're headed for trouble. You're destroying yourself and the people around you. Open your eyes. Surrender your heart. Repent of your sin. And come home to a loving God where mercy can triumph over judgment. The next plague that we see is the plague of locusts. Is that right? Yes, the plague of locusts. Chapter 10, verse 13. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all of the ground until it was black. Can you imagine walking outside and every step is a crunch? I know, it is, ew, it is. But I just want you to get in the, I want you to get and feel some of these plagues a little bit. The Bible is very descriptive. It says they devoured, they devoured all that was left after the hail. Locusts are known to eat their entire body weight every day. They're destroying everything in the entire, there's nothing left. They devour everything. It's really the plague of the teenage boy. I've got it in my house every day. They devour everything, there's nothing left. It's a bad one. Finally today, oh by the way, what's the message? Again, God keeps sending these plagues. There's a pattern here. He is speaking a message to Pharaoh. He is speaking a message to, to his people. And he is speaking a message to us through scripture today that there is no God like. The last one we'll look at today, the plague of darkness, chapter 10, verse 22. So Moses stretched out his hand. There's no warning here. He just does this. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky. In total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Darkness for three days. The next plague that we'll look at next week is the plague on the firstborn. There has to be a death, bloodshed to bring about salvation. Darkness and the sacrifice of life. Sounds a lot like that night, Jesus went to the cross to die for our sin. This is an intentional foreshadowing through the Holy Spirit in Scripture. A passage that was written hundreds of years before Jesus, but the same thing plays out the night that Jesus went to the cross. Darkness, and for three days, spiritually, the world went dark until he rose from the dead, triumphed over sin, death, hell, and the grave. So mercy could triumph over judgment. Why? Because there is no God like there's no God like Jehovah. That's the message through all of these plagues. The message to Pharaoh, 
We've all got a Pharaoh inside of us, right? The message to Pharaoh, you are not in control. You have no authority. And your sin will be judged. So let that part of us that still wants to go our own way and do our own thing, hear that message coming from the Lord through Scripture, you are not in control. You have no authority. And your sin will be judged. The message to Israel, the message to us, your God is the one true God. And if you put your faith in him, he will save and deliver you. That's hope for us today. No matter how bad things look, you need to be reminded you serve the one true God who will save and deliver you. Here's the application. So you might go, all right, we covered the plagues. That was interesting. That was neat. Um, you made some funny jokes along the way, whatever. Um, but what does that actually have to do with my life? What, what do I leave here today stronger than when I came in? Or how do I apply this tomorrow to the situations that I'm in? What's the application to me in the here and now? Well, I'm glad you asked because I want to tell you. I want to give you three quick points. You can write these down. And these are our application points today from the message. Number one, your weakness is no excuse in light of God's power. Maybe you're like Moses. Again and again, God is calling you forward. He's reminding you there's a promise on your life. He's got plans and a purpose for you that is so good and a bright future. But you keep going, I don't know, God, I think you've got the wrong person. Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know where I've been? I don't speak well. I didn't come from a good family. I dropped out of high school. I, I just, I can't keep it. I mean, don't you know who you're talking to? Maybe you're like Moses. He, do, he does that time and again. Here's the deal. Your weakness, your limitation your mistake, your failure, your insecurity is nothing in light of God's power. I know it may seem big to you. It may seem like an overwhelming mountain in your way, what you've done and all the mistakes that you've made and how you've not been there for your kids and, and all of that. But it's always a good time to start now putting your faith and trust in the Lord and following the will and the way that he's calling you to because your weakness is nothing in light of of God's power. He can redeem it and use it for his glory, just like he did for my friend Charlie, which if you were here on Wednesday night, you heard Charlie's story. He's my friend from Missouri, led him to the Lord four years ago through youth sports, by the way. We talked about that on Wednesday night, and we flew him in, and he was up here on stage with me, and he shared his story of how four years ago, he had just gotten out of jail. His marriage was falling apart. His kids didn't want to be around him, and his job was in jeopardy rock bottom. He called me one night, and we talked, and I led him to the Lord, baptized him in his hot tub in the middle of COVID, and then he's been walking with the Lord for four years. And he was up here on the stage sharing, like, I just, I'm the last person, he said, that I ever thought would be up here on this stage talking about Jesus, that God would be using me to speak truth to someone else. But yet there he was, and God used him, and he used his weakness and his pain, his mistakes. He redeemed it, and he used it for his glory to the point that after the message, after the time at the altar, I walked off stage. There was a man waiting for me. He was at rock bottom, and he, big mountain of a man, and he got me in his arms, and we just cried for a minute. I said, hey, what's going on? What's going on? That guy. That guy, that's where I, that's where I am right now. I just got out of jail. My marriage is falling apart. My kids want nothing to do with me. And I don't have any work. And he's just a broken man. And I prayed for him. And we talked. I said, have you ever made a decision to give your life to Jesus? Because that's, that's, where, that's where it starts. The way back starts there. He's like, no, I've never done that. So I led him in that prayer, standing right here. And I said, here's what I want you to know. That guy up there, Charlie, that's your future. You're where he was four years ago. But in four years, maybe just one year, you'll be where he is today. Because that's the power of God. When you bring your weakness and it's touched by God's power, it turns into your testimony. So your weakness is no excuse in light of God's power. There's no God like Jehovah. Number two. 
your unrepentant sin will lead to destruction and death. You don't hear a lot of amens on a point like that, nor probably should you, by the way. It'd be weird if you amen to that. It's a solemn thing. And I'd much rather preach about the grace and the love and the mercy and all of that. But I'm a shepherd at the end of the day. Even in a church of this size, my primary role is shepherd, to care for the sheep. And what good shepherd would watch a sheep walk off a cliff? What good shepherd would let a, a sheep get into trouble and go through pain without trying to rescue or prevent it? Jesus is the good shepherd who brings warning. He says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. There will be judgment for sin, and so this is part of God's character. In fact, it's part of his love to share with you that there's a coming judgment and your unrepentant sin will lead to destruction and death. These plagues increase in intensity. So does sin. There will be many warnings and opportunities to repent. There are for us too. But there will be a day where there are no more warnings. It says Jesus will come like a thief in the night and you'll go, well, why didn't he tell me? Why didn't he warn me? This is a warning. This is a warning. The testimony of God's people is a warning. There are plenty. We are living in the time of warning and opportunity, but there will come a time where there's no more warning. God will return for his people. And for those who have rejected his grace, there will be judgment for sin on that day at the final judgment. Number three, but if you put your faith in Jesus, mercy will triumph over judgment. God is a loving God who wants no one to perish but all to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. There's a way for your offense and your fear to become a source of hope, and it's this. Put your faith in Jesus. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I want to pray over you, and as we come to that time of prayer, I want to ask, who are you in the story today? Are you Moses? Do you have faith in God, but you don't believe God has faith in you? You don't believe you can do what he's asking you to do, and your life has been a series of excuses on why you're staying right where you are instead of following the Lord in obedience. If that's you today, I pray that the Lord would remind you your weakness is no excuse in light of his power because there is no God like Jehovah. Are you Israel today? Have you been so worn down by life? Have you gone through so much for so long? It seems like God's forgotten you. It seems like the promise has left you. It seems like this is how things are always going to be. And God wants to come and remind you again, his promise is true, and there is no God like Jehovah. Are you Pharaoh? Have you heard the warnings? been given opportunities? Have you known about church, maybe even been in church, but you refuse to change? You're continuing to go your way instead of God's way. If that's you here today, I'm begging you, repent. Surrender to the Lord today so mercy can triumph over judgment in your life. Father in heaven, I pray for my friends here today, and I ask that, Lord, for the Moses that, that's here in the room, remind them again, you are with them, your authority is in them, and that they can walk faithfully and confidently forward into what you've called them to do. To those who are Israel here today, they're just worn down. God, would you lift their chin? Would you let them know the time is now for the promise to come to reality? There is no God like you in all the world and you know what you're doing with their life. So increase their faith and remind them that you're with them today. And to the Pharaohs, I'm gonna ask you at this point to lift your chin, open your eyes, look at me. And to those of you in the room today, that's who you identify with. You don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You've never called on his name. You've never repented of your sin and trusted him with your life. This is not only a warning, this is an opportunity to return home to a loving God who says, if you'll just 
confess your sin and call on my name, I'll forgive your sin and mercy will triumph over judgment. If that's you here today, you want to get right with God, give your life to Him, rededicate your life. If you've walked away from Him, this is your moment. On the count of three, would you just lift your hand? I'll see it. I'll pray with you. And you can know today that you're one of God's children with the hope of heaven to look forward to. One, two, three. Just lift it up if that's you. And I'll pray for you. I see you. Praise God. Praise God. He sees you today. Anybody else? Hold your hand up high. I don't want to miss anybody. Anybody over here on my left? To your right. If you're watching online, this is for you as well. Man, God cares about every single one. So here's what we're going to do. For the one, raise your hand. And again, there may be some people that need to pray this prayer, but you didn't raise your hand. God knows your heart. You can pray this prayer with faith, and the same will be true for you. Along with everybody in here who loves the Lord, we're all going to pray this prayer together. And so just repeat out loud after me. And after we're done, I'm going to encourage you to stop back by the I said yes areas. There's two in the back, and there's two down here up front. And if you're near somebody that raised their hand, or the person that raised their hand, just, just go to them, just kind of say, would you like me to walk with you? I'll, I'll connect you. They're going to give you a Bible. They're going to talk about next steps. So I'd just be happy to walk with you, because at Oaks Church, no one want to walk with you. Let's repeat these words after me out loud. Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe you are who you say you are. That you died on the cross for my sin. That you rose again. That you're alive today. I ask you now to forgive me. I give you my heart. I give you my life. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate new life. Praise God. Thank you for being here today. You are hearty Texans for being at this first service this morning. And now as you go, let me pray the blessing of the Lord over you. This is from Numbers chapter 6. It's the priestly, uh, priestly blessing. It's how God marks his people. So Oaks Church, may the Lord bless you and keep you this week. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. To the glory of God, the blessing of his people. I love you guys so much. We'll see you Wednesday night for the prayer meeting. God bless. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Oaks Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. Yes, and we would love to connect you with our online family and our OC online Facebook group. To do that, you can like our Oaks Church page and click join group. And make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll have access to life-giving sermons and worship that will be a blessing to you and your family. Yeah, we'd love to have you join us live for our Sunday services and Wednesday prayer meetings. We hope you have a great day today. Thank you for watching and God bless.